information contained herein is the property of registered nurse RN and was originally composed by Sarah. It's being reproduced under the Fair Use Act of 1974 for educational purposes only. I have added to its contents. Let's start the program already in progress. So first, let's start out talking about the complete blood count, the CBC. This tells us about the cells in our blood. So what's a normal RBC range, a red blood cell range? It should be 4.5 to 5.5 million. For white blood cells, WBCs, it should be 5,000 to 10,000. For platelets, it should be 150,000 to 400,000. Now, some terms you want to be familiar with would be like thrombocytopenia. What is that? That is a low platelet count. So if they say that to you, you know that's going to be less than 150,000. Or how about a patient with leukopenia? That is a low white blood cell count. So a count less than 5,000. Now let's look at our hemoglobin and hematocrit levels. This tells us about our red blood cells. And we really use this when we're transfusing packed red blood cells. We want to know that hemoglobin level really. And it varies between the female and the male, and I would remember the differences. For a female, a, a normal hemoglobin range is 12 to 16 grams per deciliter. A normal hematocrit is 37 to 47%. And for a male, a normal hemoglobin is 14 to 18 grams per deciliter. And a normal hematocrit is 42 to 52%. Now let's look at coagulation levels. If your patient's on an anticoagulant, you definitely want to know their coagulation levels. For instance, if they're on warfarin, you want to know their PTINR. And if they're on heparin, you want to know that APTT. So let's look at this PTI. PT stands for prothrombin time, and a normal PT level in someone who's not on any anticoagulant should be 10 to 12 seconds. An INR is calculated from the PT. An INR stands for International Normalized Ratio, and normally it should be less than one, and this is for someone who's not taking any anticoagulants, specifically warfarin. But how about they are taking warfarin? What do we want that INR level to be so they're therapeutic, so this drug is working to prevent blood clots? We would want their INR to be between two to three. So if it's less than two, this Coumadin, this warfarin is not really achieving what we need. So their dose would need to be increased. If it was way greater than three, they are at risk for bleeding. So their dose would need to be decreased. Now let's look at this APTT. This stands for activated partial thromboplastin time. And this is used to, for patients who are taking heparin. A normal APTT in a patient who's not taking heparin is 30 to 40 seconds. Now if they're taking heparin, we need them to be within this certain range so they're therapeutic and this drug is working. So we would want it to be one and a half to two and a half times this normal range, which, which ends up being about 60 to 80 seconds. Now if they were less than 60, that would mean that we're not achieving what we need. They're not therapeutic. So their dose would need to be increased of heparin. If they're greater than 80 seconds, it's taking them way too long to clot. So they really have too much heparin in their system. So their dose would need to be decreased. Now let's switch and let's look at the metabolic panel. Again, this is going to tell us about our fluid and electrolytes, which will include glucose, our renal function. And if it's comprehensive, it's going to tell us how our liver is functioning as well. So let's look at these ranges. Okay. Glucose, a normal glucose is 70 to hundred milligrams per deciliter. Calcium level is 8.5 to 10.5 milligrams per liter. Chloride is 95 to 105 milli equivalents per liter. Magnesium is 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams per deciliter. 
Uh, phosphorus is 2.5 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. Potassium is 3.5 to 5 milli equivalents per liter. And a sodium is 135 to 145 milli equivalents per liter. Now how I remember those is that they're like multiples of five. Like everything is represented with five. So if you can remember that, it'll help keep you straight. Now let's look at let me just interject here and tell you what the different electrolytes are for. I think it's important to know what the different electrolytes are for in case the NCLEX ask you questions. Uh, for example, muscle cramping. What electrolyte probably has the imbalance if the NCLEX talks about muscle cramping? And that would be magnesium. But how would you know that unless someone tells you? So let me pause here and tell you what the different electrolytes are for, and please take notes. So let's look at the whiteboard here that I put up and talk about some of these electrolytes that I think are important for the NCLEX. Sodium, for example, is an electrolyte that helps to balance fluid levels in the body and facilitates neuromuscular functioning. Remember that water follows salt. So if a person has a lot of sodium, uh, they are going to retain fluids. This is why it's important to know uh, not just the level of these electrolytes, like Sarah is so showing you, but the what the actual electrolyte is for. Uh, potassium is a main component of cellular fluid. This electrolyte helps to regulate neuromuscular function and osmotic pressure. Remember too, when you give a dig that low potassium levels can cause digitalis toxicity. So remember that we want to check our potassium levels when levels when giving digoxin or linoxin is the generic name. Uh, calcium. What does calcium do? Well, calcium is an electrolyte that affects the neuromuscular performance and contributes to skeletal growth and blood coagulation. So, when on Wolverine or on heparin or certain heart medications, you want to check the individual's calcium levels, right? Good job. Magnesium, I just mentioned that, influence mus influences muscle contractions and intracellular activity. So if a person is experiencing muscle cramps, for example, they may need magnesium. And I have a few more here to tell you about. Okay, another electrolyte that's important is chloride. Uh, that regulates blood pressure. Phosphate is a negatively charged electrolyte that impacts metabolism and regulates acid-base balance and calcium levels. You see why it's important to know what these electrolytes are for? Uh, just in case whatever the NCLEX might throw at you, right? And the last one I want you to know, and just take notes, I know I'm going a little too fast, but just take notes, is an, uh, bicarbonate is an electrolyte that assists in the regulation of blood pH levels, bicarbonate insufficiencies, and elevations cause acid-base disorders like respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis. Bicarbonate is responsible for that. All right, now let's continue with Sarah's program already in progress. This per deciliter. And then albumin. This is another protein. Remember, albumin played a huge role in regulating our oncotic pressure. And it's 3.4 to 5.4 grams per deciliter. Then we have these three enzymes that are found in the liver. It's the ALP, the ALT, and the AST. And if these are abnormal, it could indicate liver disease or some type of other disease in the body. So a normal ALP, which stands for alkaline phosphatase is 40 to 120 units per liter. Then we have ALT, which stands for alanine transaminase, and a normal range is 7 to 56 units per liter. And then the AST, which is aspartate transaminase, 
A normal is 10 to 40 units per liter. Then the last part of our metabolic panel is the bilirubin. And this substance is created when you have the breakdown of red blood cells. And when red blood cells break down, they release this reddish orangish color. And a normal bilirubin level should be less than one milligrams per deciliter. But if your patient has an elevated one, you will notice that they will have this orangish yellowish hue to their skin or this mucous membrane where all this bilirubin has collected in the blood and has just leaked into the skin giving them that like pumpkin hue appearance. Now let's look at the lipid panel. This test is going to tell us about our patient's risk for cardiovascular disease and it's going to look at the LDL, the HDL, the total cholesterol, and the triglycerides. So LDL, this stands for low density lipoprotein and we want this value to be low. So we want it to be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. Now the HDL, which stands for high density lipoprotein, we want this number to be high. And we want it greater than 60 milligrams per deciliter. So some people get these confused, but how I remember it is that L for LDL stands for low, so we want that number low. And the HDL, it stands for high, so we want this number high. Now total cholesterol, we want that less than 200 milligrams per deciliter, and then triglycerides less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. Now let's move on to arterial blood gases, ABGs. I have a whole video on how to interpret ABGs to know if it's respiratory metabolic problem, if it's acidosis, alkalosis, compensation, partial compensation, and check out that video because it'll show you how to do the tic-tac-toe method and really simplify how to get those answers. But you want to know the normal ranges for those. So a blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Anything less than 7.35 is acidic. Anything greater than 7.45 is alkaline. Then we have a PCO2. The normal range for that is 35 to 45. And I have switched them here because anything greater than 45 is acidic and anything less than 35 is alkaline. Then we have bicarb, HCO3. The normal range is 22 to 26. And anything less than 22 is acidic and anything greater than 26 is alkaline. Then we have PO2, which normal is 80 to 100%. And then we have the oxygen saturation, and a normal is about 96, 95 to 100%. Now let's switch to the hemoglobin A1C test. This test is really helpful in helping us determine the average glucose in a person over the last three months. So it's great for patients who have diabetes, so we can see their average glucose. So what do we want this number to be? Well, in a person who does not have diabetes, we would want them to have a hemoglobin A1C of four to six percent. But if they have diabetes, we would like for their target hemoglobin A1C to be less than seven percent. Now let's wrap up this lecture and let's talk about the most common drug levels you may encounter on NCLEX. So first up is digoxin. A normal dig level is 0.5 to 2 nanograms per milliliter. Then we have carbamazepine, which is Tegretol. Normal level is four to 10 micrograms per milliliter. Dilantin, a normal level is 10 to 20 micrograms per milliliter. Then Theophylin, normal level, same as Dilantin, is 10 to 20 micrograms per milliliter. Then we have Phenobarbital, a normal level is 15 to 40 micrograms per milliliter. Lithium, at 0.5 to 1.2 millimoles per liter. And then lastly, valproic acid, also known as Depakote. It is 50 to 100 micrograms per milliliter.